Let's give it up for the band leading us in worship today. I really like the new song. Y'all are down with that new song? I like it a lot. Mm. Some cheeky worship leader, right? Just moved the W over. Did y'all notice that? Nowhere, now here. Please tell me I'm not the only one that noticed that. Wow. Anyway, uh, we've been covering a new series. Uh, we do At the Movies every now and again. It's been a couple years. And uh, this week we're going to be looking at Pirates of the Caribbean, the original. And we're going to be looking specifically at a scene with Captain Barbosa. And he is discussing the curse of the Aztec gold. And today I've titled the sermon, The More Monster. The More Monster. And um, I want you guys to begin thinking before we watch this clip about things that we can become consumed by. I don't know if your personality is like my personality, but I can tell you that I can become fixated on things. I don't know if anybody else has this problem. Is anybody else a member of the club? Like, you know, you, you like start off and it's like a little project, but then like slowly but surely it becomes like more and more and more and like, and now you're like, oh, I must have, like, you know, like some people, like, they must have all their shoes. Just, you know, you know, you just, you know, a little OCD, right? You become fixated. And here in this North Dallas uh, culture, I think that the more monster is more of a way of life uh, than in other parts of the country. Um, and I think that this is a strong temptation that we become consumed with gathering more and more and more. And Honestly, whenever we, we think about that, it's a, it's a zero-sum game when it's all said and done. And, and that's the message that I'm going to get into. And I wanted you to begin thinking with me before we watch this clip together. Is there anything that you're substituting for your focus of your affection? Like, is, is God number one in your life? And, and I, I hope that I can make some arguments today that can save you from making some mistakes because every time we allow something to get in the way of God, it ends up costing us in the end. And so we're going to be watching this dialogue from Captain Barbosa. And the quote that I want to take away from that in just a moment is he says that we were compelled by greed, but now we are consumed by it. And I just want you to begin thinking about that. Is there anything that God would have you consider this morning that you might need to, you know, adjust in your life? So watch this with me and then we'll talk about it. Ooh. Some of you are going to watch that this afternoon. I know you're like, oh, we need to watch that. I want you to begin thinking like, is that... Is that maybe typical? Is that a picture of possibly some of our motives and desires? That sometimes they were obviously seeking out this goal, but then it had strings attached. And I don't know if you've ever uh, indulged yourself with something and all of a sudden now it had strings that you weren't anticipating. It is such as whenever we substitute things instead of God, that's, that's what happens. We have these consequences that are unintended by the things that we become consumed by. Um, it has that odd flavor, right, of Adam and Eve in the garden that they took hold of the tree, but it had all these consequences that they didn't foresee. And so today as we go through this message, I hope that you'll be listening. And, and maybe uh, sometimes whenever our priorities become out of whack and whenever God is not first in our lives, it has these terrible unintended intended consequences that are a result of sometimes our greed uh, being substituted uh, for God. And so Jesus weighed in on this, and we're going to look at a parable, and then we're going to look at an off-the-beaten-path story in the Old Testament that's going to support an argument that we're going to make. Um, this is going to be uh, the barn builder parable, a little-known parable that Jesus spoke on. It says that Jesus told them a parable. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So he had, he had blessed, blessed beyond measure, right? More than you could handle. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to put my crops. He said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus of grain. All completely, totally reasonable. And there I will store my surplus of grain and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then 
who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Principle inside the parable, last verse. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Now, we're to call this building bigger barns, building bigger barns, bigger barns without a better kingdom. I want you to think about that for a moment. There is a fine line, correct, between success and greed, right? Because we all should have a desire to be successful. I hope that you don't go to your job to not be successful, right? That would be terrible. And, you know, you don't have a marriage to, to not be successful. You don't like it. Let's get married so we can get divorced. No one, no one says that, I hope. Um, and so, you know, no one says, let's, let's bring a child in this world so that it'll be miserable. But, you know, it's, it's like there, there's, a, there's a desire for success, and success is not bad. But what if success becomes a substitute for God? Here this guy was. He said, I'll build some bigger barns. There's nothing wrong with building bigger barns. There's nothing wrong with increasing your staff or, you know, increasing your salary or increasing your lot in life and providing for your family. There's nothing wrong with those things. But what if you substitute that success for your affection for God? Then you would literally be putting the cart in ahead of the horse. Or there's an old preacher adage it says that you will never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Has anybody, by show of hands, has anybody ever heard this phrase? Okay. It just means that you can't, you can't take it with you, right? So what if your whole life was about gathering more, 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 but you weren't ever gathering more for God? See, the motive matters. Like, because if, if you were saying, God, I want to maximize my profession for your kingdom, and I want to use my profession to spread your light, love, all the things, and share in my abundance and blessings with your church, which is the vehicle through which you reach the world with the only gospel that has the power to save. If you had that motive, then increase only equals increase for God. So then the thing isn't the thing. It's thankfulness for the thing to the one who blessed you with the thing that is the focus of the exercise. Jesus said that some people... We're into just building bigger barns. Now, can you see how deceptive and subtle that that could become of, of gathering more? That, that if money is ever the motive, then all of a sudden you take something that in and of itself isn't bad. But then you create it and you, you corrupt it as you become consumed by that thing. And I just want you to start thinking, is there anything right now that's consuming your life? Anything that's consuming you that's been substituted for God? Because as we look at this story in just a moment, there's a, a guy named Gehazi. And just to set the tone for the story, that you'll see how he kind of went off on a tangent that ultimately cost him dearly. Um, there was a prophet who was the head prophet named Elisha. Now, we just finished a series on Elijah, okay? Just like the cheeky worship leader, uh, just a substitution of a couple of letters. Um, Elijah was the successor. I'm sorry, it was the predecessor. And Elisha was his successor. He came on the scene. He did all these miracles. And one in particular um, was of note that we've preached about in the past. And it was a guy named Naaman. And Naaman was from Syria. And he had this disease called leprosy. And leprosy was incurable, okay? It was incurable. It was terrible, terrible disease. So your body slowly just rotted away piece by piece. And he was over in Syria, and, and there was a, a servant, a slave, that had, had become indentured in Syria. And, and this servant said that there is this, this prophet named Elisha. He's over there in Israel, and he can, he can fix your problem. And Naaman was like, well, tell me more. Like if, if, you, if you had an incurable disease and someone told you that there was a way, right, you'd be open. You'd be open to it. And so he was like, all right. And so he talked to the king, and this guy was a soldier, and the, the, the king sent him a ransom and sent the soldier because he was very valuable to the king. And, and he went over to Israel, and, and he came up to Elisha. He talked to him, and Elisha told him to go down and dip seven times in the river, and you'll be healed. And sure enough, Naaman did exactly what the man of God said, and he came up seven times. Healed, glory, hallelujah, praise Jesus moment, right? And this is where the story gets kind of interesting. Naaman 
said, I brought this treasure. And out of my gratitude, I would like to give you a king's ransom, literally. And Elisha was like, no, no, I, I, I don't want to accept that. Because it's nothing wrong with him receiving money, but God's stuff isn't for sale. Did you guys know that? Like, like we don't charge you for the seat that you sit in. Does everybody understand that? Did anybody charge you a cover charge when you came in? Right? No. Like the things of God aren't for sale. And what Elisha didn't want to happen was for him to mistakenly believe that you could pay for the thing that God wants to freely give you. And so he refused this treasure. All right? That's where we're going to pick up the story. Elisha had a servant named Gehazi. And it says that Gehazi, which is an odd name, I, I know. Um, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman. And I think he even said this Aramean, which is Syrian in our modern day culture. And anytime you're talking about people and like kind of using their ethnicity, that's probably just a bad way to go. You can't really say that Aramean, right? You can't, you can't really say that. And so he said to himself, like, you know, like we, we, we should have got something for this, right? I mean, I mean, a miracle, you know, you got healed, you know, I feel like we should charge him some, some charge, nominal charge, you know, bill him. And so it says that he said to himself, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about that. My master was too easy on Naaman by not accepting from him what he brought. So as surely as the Lord lives, so let's put some God card on it. Have you ever heard Christians, like, do things and put the God card on it? Has anybody ever seen this? Like, you know, like, oh, well, I'm going to pray for uh, riches. I'm going to pray for an increase in my salary. There's nothing wrong with, you know, praying. But, like, if you never pray for God's will to be done in spite of what it might work out for you like are you real you know see what I'm saying you guys see what I'm saying he said I will run after him and he said I will get something from him would you look at that last phrase uh, I will get something from him and I I wanted that to be a catalyst for our thought processes in our relationships with others that whenever we have bad motives that it can be disguised with good intentions think about that have you ever had a very slick salesman talk to you about something? You guys ever had like a really good, like anybody ever like, you ever walked into a place saying to yourself, I'm not going to buy, and then you walked out with the thing that you said you weren't going to buy? Is anybody, by show of hands, anybody? Yeah, we've all experienced that. Now, does a good salesman come up and just hyper pressure you and like, hey, you got to buy this car, you got to buy this car, or do, do they all of a sudden start talking to you about how it will benefit you? I, hey, I could put you in this house today. Think about your family, you know? Wouldn't they be more comfortable in this? And like all of a sudden, a good salesperson, right? It's not about them, it's about you. But who's it really about? Them, right? That's, a, that's the whole secret. That's the whole secret inside of sales, right? If, if you have this Gehazi mentality. He said to himself, you know, as surely as the Lord lives. I mean, the Lord would probably have liked for Elisha and the prophets in the church and the school or, you know, Old Testament, whatever you want to say, you know, he, he probably would have, you know, Elisha missed this one. You know, he missed this one. I'm going to set it straight. And so I have the purest of motives. It's not about me. It's not that I will maybe like as a byproduct get a raise from this. You know, it's not about me. It's really about, it's really about other things. I don't want you to be in thinking about that, that I think this is the trap that many people fall into. Is that you have bad motives in your heart, but you've learned to disguise them with good intentions. Think about that. Like if a boss, like I know we have some some owners of companies in here. And think about if, if a boss was all about, or an owner of a business was all about the bottom line, right? Just the bottom line. And the people really didn't matter. It'd almost be like Clark Griswold's boss. Do y'all remember, like, you know, we cut out bonuses. What are you talking about? They gave him a Jelly of the Month club, right? And it says that like he deserved, like he has to have the bonus, but he wanted to plan, and that was part of the planning. And like here this boss was just being greedy. It's not like the company was getting ready to go under. It was just pure greed. 
hey, grease ball, hey, you know, anyway, anyway, he couldn't remember his name, it's so sad, like, imagine if you worked for a company, or you the owner of the company, and like, if the person was just about their money, but they didn't really care about you, would you feel inspired by such a leader? Would you, would you feel like, oh, I'm going to do more as a result of them not caring about me? No. And if we're not careful, that's, that's the trap that we fall into. If you want the litmus test of whether or not you have bad motivations, and now we're going to get into some introspection, it's whether you're about giving inside of the relationship or are you about getting. Are you about giving or are you about getting? Because if you're more about getting than you are about giving, then all of a sudden your motive, I'm going to call it into question. I'm going to say that Jesus was always about you. That he was always saying, love others ahead of yourself. And so the whole God principle inside of your life allows you to have success by putting others first. Now you tell me if that is not in stark contrast to what the world would teach you. The world would say, you put you first. It's your happiness. And imagine how destructive that is inside of relationships. Imagine a friendship, for instance. Imagine a friendship in which something really good happened to you and you were excited about it. You like, you couldn't wait. And you're going to tell your friend about it. Like, ah, this amazing thing happened. Like I found this dress. It was on sale. Whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it is. Maybe it's something more serious, like, you know, oh, you know, my child's sick, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what to do, I can't get him to go to sleep, whatever it is. Imagine that every time that you shared a concern or a highlight, that the person always bounced to their own stuff. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, like oh, you know, my child, you know what, my child's sick too. As a matter of fact, one time they had malaria. And like, they, they go off into like, every time. They, they, they never are empathetic. They never reflects it. And like, I'm going to do something. Like, you could pay maybe a couple hundred dollars for counseling for what I'm giving you here, okay? I'm trying to help you. Like, if your wife is telling you a story, you don't answer her story with your story. You're like, oh, yeah. Well, that must have been tough. Oh, really? Tell me more about that. All right, your husband comes home and he's shot a great round of golf. You know, like, okay, yeah, I gotta get there. You just fly right. He's excited. Are you not excited that he's excited? You're like, oh, it's just golf. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. So many times we are really bad in relationships because we're not good listeners and we're really thinking about ourselves. What's my story that I can tell? I've even seen, as crazy as this is gonna sound, I've seen a grieving widow that is burying a husband. And people take a funeral, like at the funeral, and start like, yeah, I just really love that person. You weren't the spouse of the dead person. Please have some respect. Yes, your hurting may be hurt, but it's not nothing compared to the grieving widow. And the church said, amen. Like, you can't make a funeral about you. You gotta make it about the person who just lost the love of their life. How crazy are we that we can turn anything when we're consumed by the more monster into something that's really about us? Imagine a marriage in which you were more about you, that you were trying to everything, like when you pick the restaurant, it has to be your restaurant. When you pick the movie, it has to be a movie that you like. Like guys, at some point, you know, if she wants to watch Pride and Prejudice, you got to just watch it. You know, Ben has told me stories. He's got all these daughters, and he knows, like, all these little woman movies I've never seen. i got three boys. Anything that you can fight, kill, bleed, something like that, that's a boy movie, okay? I'm not saying that girls can't watch it. Anyway, I don't want to get off on this tangent. People are canceling me right now. I'm just trying to say in a marriage it. It has to be sometimes you're doing what they like. You know, that's, that's how we show affection, is that we subjugate our wants to the wants of our spouse. And husbands, I'll just give you a little note, if you read the Bible, it's on you to exercise the initiative in that. God says that you 
are to love your wife the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So if you don't like what you're getting, you might want to consider what you're giving. Anyway, this is like a whole other sermon. But if you're more about getting than you are about giving, then I think you're messing it up. And Gehazi was looking at this moment, and he's like, I'm going to go get something from that guy. Wow. I hope that even with God, you would really think about that. You know, sometimes I think people are more into what they're getting from God, and it's less about what they can give back to God. Praise, honor, worship, all the things, you know. Those are just something you consider, like in your economy. If I was looking at the evidence of how you spend your, your time and your treasure and all that kind of stuff, you know, would, would I see enough there that I would say, oh, yeah, God's obviously first in their life. If not, maybe we need to move today. Maybe we need to make some adjustments. It says that Gehazi hurried after Naaman. So he went on a covert mission. And said when Naaman saw him, he was in such a hurry that Naaman was like, hey, is everything all right? And Gehazi was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's all right. Everything's fine. Um, it's just that my master uh, wanted me to come tell you, right? <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, he's name dropping, right? And he said, two young men uh, from a company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothes. When our motives are impure, we start making things up, right? Have you ever, have you ever been tempted? Have you ever seen someone that, let's say that, I don't know, maybe, maybe this woman, for instance, was really upset with this other woman. And then she's talking to her friends. And then she naturally wants her friend women to be upset with that woman based upon her upsetness with that woman. I don't know if this is a hypothetical. I don't know if this has ever <laughs> happened. Um, I've just thought of, just make something up off the top of my head. But if, if it could happen, just imagine that this person that they're talking to is not like, like you know, not really passionately hating this other person the way that her friend wants her to hate this person. And so she might be tempted to start like, you know, embellishing the facts just a little bit. Like, you know, it's, you know, uh, you know, and then she said, and then she did this. And it's like, well, did she say that? Well, I mean, she might as well have said it. And it's like, you know, I know what she meant by when she didn't say that, right? No one would ever, okay, you know, just preaching to the choir here. It's amazing how we, we start having this bad motive that we started with, and now we try, to, we try to draw people in, and we start making things up. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own truth. You see, truth is, is the truth, and you can't just make up your own truth. Here is Gehazi, and now he's saying... Oh, there's some prophets that need some silver and some clothing. And my master has sent me to get it from you. It's always interesting in a really good deception. You have to really make it about someone else. It's not about me. It's not about my needs. It's not about Elisha. There was these two guys that came along. And sometimes I think we start saying to ourselves, and we have this false notion of good. And it's like a guise for our greed. Think about your family like a, if a parents want to provide for their children, like, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to make all this money and, and it's for my children, right? It's for the family. And I, I don't know. Think of, is it possible that, that you're just building a bigger barn for your family, but if God's kingdom doesn't expand as a result of you building a bigger barn for your family, then ultimately is that, are you kind of substituting your family for God? As if, if you blessed God first in your life, he couldn't take care of your family. It would almost be like you were putting yourself in the God seat of being responsible for the blessing of your family. Just be careful just be careful what you're putting first in your life because I don't think you want to be in the God seat. It says that 
when he went home, and I'll, I'll, I just want to share this before I get there. If you're ever going to steal, okay, and I don't recommend stealing, never, but if you're going to steal, don't steal from a prophet, right? You guys, you see what I'm saying? Like imagine if a person had this mystical power to be able to like see things that they weren't around. Like you wouldn't want to steal from that guy, right? Gehazi, he decides like he's going to go do this thing as if Elisha's not going to know. And so it says, when he went and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? Boy, that has that, that flavor of when God went into the garden and Adam and Eve all of a sudden had fig leaves on. Y'all remember that? Like, that's kind of crazy moment. Like, well, why are the fig leaves all of a sudden? You know, God is never asking a question to you that he doesn't know the answer to. It's kind of wild how God can preach to you, right? Like you came in here today and you may not have ever been here before. And you thought, oh, I'll just go check off and go visit and, you know, we're shopping or, you know, church is something we do every week. And all of a sudden God starts, you know, asking you questions in the middle of the sermon. Huh, where have you been? What you been up to? What's going on in your life? And like, you know that I'm asking an innocuous question, but on the inside, it's a deeper question. And God already knows the answer. Gehazi said, your servant didn't go anywhere. I've been here all day. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Can you imagine being Gehazi at this moment? Like, he like shares a detail that no one else could know, and you're sitting there freaking out, right? Like, oh, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? Is this the time to take money or accept clothes or olive groves or vineyards or 401ks or stock options or flocks and herds or male or female servants? He said, Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Can you imagine the dramatic irony that Naaman, the pagan, came all the way from Syria to hear from a, a man that he had never met about a God that could only do what the God of Israel could do, that no other God in his own country could do, and miraculously, seven times in the Jordan, on the seventh time, an incurable disease was cured, amazing, glory, hallelujah, shout it from the mountaintops. And Naaman wants to pay, and Elisha says no. And then Gehazi goes and does it anyway. He's asking him a question. Is it the time to take money? Because what Gehazi did was cheapen what God intended. You see? Do you see that? Like, God is trying to paint this beautiful picture. Naaman, salvation from the God of Israel is free. It's free. You, you can't pay for it. You can't be good enough. You can't work enough. It's free. Free from God. And then Gehazi went and did this thing and he cheapened it. Gehazi did not know how to read the spiritual room. Have you ever, you ever seen someone who lacks awareness, right? Like Elisha the prophet, who was able to do all these incredible things. He called a bear out of the woods, ate some children one time. Crazy story. Like, if that guy says the answer's no, what's the answer? No. If he says the answer's yes, then what's the answer? The answer is yes. It's what God says. God says, and that's the way it is. God's word is the final word. Elisha was the voice of God. Why don't you all start thinking about that for a moment, that, that God has created the life 
that's inside of you. Did you know that? That God is the author of life. He breathed breath into an empty shell of a human. That human had all the components of life. But it wasn't until God breathed life into it that it became a living thing. Okay? God created the life that's inside of you. And wouldn't it be a travesty if you took this incredible gift, just like Naaman's gift, and if we cheapened it and made it about money, that God has this incredible plan for you to impact eternity by how you connect to what he's doing to reach people, to love people, to be the light for people, and if you made it about something less, building barns, more, more, more. I know that we are all going to face that temptation. And under the guise of our family, I can get it. I can see how it happens. I, I had this story that, that I ran into one time that is very similar to this. Um, 2008-ish, um, I was on a, it was 2007, I was on a, a medical mission trip. I got to go with a group of people, complete strangers, and we went to Nicaragua, and we were providing health care for some people, I mean, way out, we were in the jungle. And um, it was a crazy, crazy experience. And while I was on that trip, the leader of the trip, he said, hey, um, I know that you guys are church planting, You're, we were in an elementary school at that time, and he said, uh, there's this guy that's going to be on this trip, and he goes, and you might want to get to know him. He has some money, and he might want to help you with your church project. And I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll meet anyone. I'll meet anyone. I'll talk to anyone. Who wouldn't talk to anyone, right? If you were in starting your own business and someone's like, hey, there's a guy, an investor, let me introduce you, you wouldn't be like, no, I will not. And so I got to go on a, a, a primary trip uh, to start another project in Honduras, and it was about eight months later, and, and as I was getting ready to go on this trip, it's just going to be three of us, and um, I was talking to my wife, and I was like, you know, I, it's like, you know the Lord just starts messing with you? Is it, you know, you ever had that happen? Like, you know, you're just going along, living your selfish life, and then the Lord, like, just starts like, hey, you know, you're, you're kind of being consumed about you lately. And I was going down there, and I was like, you know, Carrie, I don't, I don't feel good about this. Like, this guy was like, hey, you need to meet this guy, and I'm going to go over here and talk to this guy, but, but I really have, like, an alternative motive, like, I'm going to sell my church. All right, you know, what can I do to put you into this church today, you know? We've got a lovely children's ministry, a fantastic student ministry. we got a singles group. we got a young group. <laughs> you know, it's like, man, you got to be careful with that. I said, you know, I, I don't think that that's why, I don't think that's what I, why I'm going on this trip. I don't think that's what it's about. And I started, started talking to the Lord. I started reasoning it out. And I was like, you know what? This guy was extremely wealthy. What, what do I have to give a person who has everything? Have you ever been in a situation like that? Like, what, what would you give someone who already has it? Maybe two of everything, right? And God really convicted me. And it was like, ah, mm, wait. I go down there and we have a trip and we don't talk about Genesis Metro. We talked about his dream and his vision to build an orphanage in Honduras. And I found out that my skills in a nonprofit and pastoring and people gathering and resourcing for people to go on trips and build an orphanage, I felt that was what he needed. And that's what I was able to give. And I was able to make his dream come true without ever talking about my dream. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. If I would have gone in there being selfish, I would have been thinking about what could I stand to gain? And God convicted me, and I'll tell you this truth. Some of you are shortchanging yourself in your relationships. And you say to yourself, like, what do, I, what, do I, what do I have to give? I don't have this, I don't have that. If you have God living inside of you as a result of the salvation that he, by grace, gave you, as a result of what he did at the cross, then you should always have something to give in your relationships. Right? Do you understand? 
So imagine if God was first in your relationship, you would never run out. There's not a scarcity problem. So I was tempted because a guy told me, hey, get to know him. And then like God was like, no, it's not something that you stand to gain. It's something that you have to give. Now our church went down there and we did a mission trip. A thousand people accepted Christ in four days. Now would that have happened had I went down there looking for what I could get versus what I could give? What you been thinking about that? The more monster takes from us opportunities. Whenever it comes to Lot's wife in the Old Testament, one more look. One more look because she was consumed with the culture that she had invested herself in that was at odds with God. One more look, she said, and one more look cost her everything. Whenever we think of Samson, it was one more dance with Delilah. And it cost him his strength and it cost him his vision. Not that any man ever could preach the story of one more dance cost you more than you ever thought you were going to pay. Man, that more monster takes from us. Even when we think about Judas selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he sold his Savior. I started deconstructing that in my mind and I said, Judas came to a conclusion that this world would be better without Jesus. And I said, yeah, okay, application. Have you ever taken a break from God? Have you ever decided that, oh, you know what, God, I need to do my own thing for a little while and that my life will be better somehow? As I take a break from God, church, the Bible, and if you've run that, that sample set, I just want to ask you a question. Has your life ever been better as a result of being less close to God or having less church in your life, less Christian community in your life? I'm going to tell you, if you run that example a hundred times and you carry it out far enough, 100% of the time, when you substitute your success for God's success, it's always going to end badly. Building better, bigger barns without a better kingdom. The truth of Christianity is that less is actually more. When John the Baptist sees Jesus coming on the scene, he said, I must decrease so that you might increase. Gehazi said, God, I want you to increase by doing something that's not your will, which really is for me. Man, I hope that your motive in your worship, your motive in your pursuit of Christ, I hope it's honest. I hope it's real. I hope that you would rather God's kingdom grow, even if that meant your kingdom Little, little kingdom was less. That when we look at the 90 whatever baptisms that have happened in the last three months at Genesis Metro, 82 at Fuse Camp, all the decisions that were made last week at, uh, at Extreme Camp two weeks ago, when you look at all those decisions, like that, that's worth it. That's lives changed forever. Every time a marriage walks in here on the verge of decay, well, let's just face it. Most people, when they show up to church in their adult life, something has gone wrong, not something has gone right. Am I preaching? And you walked in here and you heard God's truth. And if you applied it to your life, guess what? You can be transformed. You can grow. Things can get better. You can change the generational curse that has plagued your family for decades. Man, that's worth it. That's the good stuff. I hope that you would never take the world's treasure and substitute it for God's best. If today you find yourself struggling with the wrong motives, you know what? You can make that change today. You could just simply say to God, hey God, I want to make you first. Help me, God. Help me to make you first. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you the way you would wake up tomorrow, oh, you'd have so much more freedom. Whenever you look at, that was them cueing me to wrap this sermon up. 
Whenever you think about your profession and whether or not you're going to have enough to make it through the next month, wouldn't it be better if you knew that you had trusted God with your first and that God was going to make sure that you have the rest? Wouldn't you rather God be your CEO than you? I just encourage you, today's message, the more monster. It needs to be more of God and less of you. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would help us all because we're all going to face temptation. We're all going to be tempted to put ourselves first in every relationship, in our business. God, that we would consider your kingdom. We would consider what you're trying to do to save a lost and dying world. And we would say, God, that's, that's better than my stuff. I'd rather have your stuff than my stuff. And if we would make that decision today, I know that every family in here would be blessed as a result of honoring you first in our lives. God, we ask these things in your name. And the church said, amen. Would you guys stand with us as we worship?